Hello, and welcome to another segment of Fine Arts Features, the program that highlights members of the faculty and staff of the College of Fine Arts here at Wichita State University. Today, we have a conversation with Ray Clitheroe, the Director of Fine Arts Facilities. Ray is a true Wichita born and raised. He came to Wichita State to major in theater and found his true passion to be behind the stage rather than on it. After leaving Wichita State, he took a number of professional technical jobs throughout the United States, including such stops as Louisville and Philadelphia, where he worked at such prestigious theaters as Bucks County Playhouse and Pocono Playhouse. He also toured nationally with Mickey Rooney's Broadway hit, Sugar Babies. Eventually, he found his way back to Wichita, where he has left his mark throughout the metropolitan area. He is known particularly for his work with Century 2 as a business manager for IATSE, as well as his long-standing time at WSU. His responsibilities here include the coordination of all facilities within the college, as well as the supervision of performance facilities which oversees the more than 500 performances and presentations done by the college annually. Without further ado, I give you Ray Clitheroe. Hello, and welcome to another session of Fine Arts Features. Today, we're featuring uh, one of the legends of the campus, <laughs> Ray Clitheroe who is the Director of Fine Arts Facilities and also is in charge of a couple of programs here in the college um, and <clears throat> I'll say on, uh, on campus because uh, Ray's responsibilities uh, actually transcend uh, just working for the College of Fine Arts. But uh, he's also in charge of performance facilities and the box office for the College of Fine Arts and in uh, uh, those responsibilities, um, he is responsible for people who are responsible for coordinating and scheduling uh, over 500 performances and presentations by the college um, in a typical academic year. Ray is a native Wichita, uh, a West High graduate, I believe. Nope. Nope. Oh, got that got that wrong. This yeah, you did. Oh, uh, which high school? Northwest. Northwest. Oh, okay. Very first class. Oh, oh, the very first class. All right. Well, right. that's a that's part of the story. The the first yeah, question I'm going to ask you: Who who are you, Ray Clitheroe? Tell us, well, like you said, your life story. <laughs> I'm a a native Wichita, born and bred. Um, Grew up on the west side when the west side was not uh, as developed. Um, I was born right after the big ditch was finished, actually. So, you know, before then, things flooded downtown. Mm. Um, went two years to West High at West High. And then in 1978, when Northwest High School opened, I moved there for my senior year, um, had looked into, well, had gotten interested in theater at West. That's, you know, and thought, oh, that this could be okay. Uh, could be a good major when I go to school. You know, when I go into university, looked into KU, looked into couple of other smaller schools and by default ended up at Wichita State because it was, you know, it was close to home. I yeah. guess living home, mm -hmm. know, the, the, the typical Wichita State student at that time. Yeah. Yeah. But so, what, what, what did you find in the uh, theater program? The people, the Opportunities. And you know, so I, I'm not really sure. I think it, in, at, at Wichita State, it was, you know, doing theater, at, I'm not really sure what I had intended to do. Yeah. That's probably one of the reasons I never graduated. 
I just kind of fumbled around for a few years and no, no one ever really gave me any direction. Uh. Uh, it wasn't until I started working as a stagehand for guy a local that I really got, Oh, you mean people pay you to do this <laughs> and they can pay fairly well. Hmm. Maybe, maybe this is the way to go. Well, so let me, let me uh, drill down a little bit. So you did come to Wichita state. You, uh, you decided before you came here to major in theater, right? But it wasn't necessarily that you were going to major in theater technology. No, you were, you were just, and so when you got here, you, and, and keep in mind too, that there was no theater, technical theater degree at the time. Mm. It was just theater. And the emphasis at that time was on acting. Yeah. There was stagecraft, there was stage lighting, there was costuming. You know, I think there was a scene design course. And I think a makeup course, and that was it. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, you didn't get any drafting. You didn't get, you know, there was there there was nothing. Stage management. Well, you know, now yeah, we need somebody to call the cues. Yeah, and so much of that has changed now. We have oh, yeah. a lot of those specific uh, degrees and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the one thing you did did do is a lot of theater. Um, right. I know from that, that uh, the conversations that you and I've had, you gravitated toward the technical aspect of it right. and did a lot of backstage stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and that could be another reason I didn't graduate because I did just about it. You know, I worked on just about every show. Yeah. And at that time there were five main stage and four or five experimental theater and Reader's Theater, which was supposed to be a staged reading and became more of a experimental theater light with scenery and costumes and lighting and hmm. kind, of be, kind of grew into more, something more than it should have been, or was intended to be. Yeah. So you, uh, you, you, you gravitated away from Wichita State at some point and then started working out in the community. Talk, talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. That was, that was kind of an interesting time in my life. Um, I was working out in the community, mainly at Century Two or at the Kansas Coliseum at the yeah. time. Um, went out to... Every so often I would go out and, and work at a, you know, I'd take, a, I'd take a gig, say, at Bucks County Playhouse in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Or uh, I did a couple of seasons in, in Kentucky at the Iroquois Amphitheater, which is a um, copy of the amphitheater in St. Louis. Mm. The, <clears throat> excuse me. Or... You know, the, the, the kind of the highlight was actually being on the road with a little show called Sugar Babies with Mickey Rooney. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so you were a roadie uh, for a yeah. while. OK, yeah. well, what what uh, what brought you back to Wichita? Family. I'd say Family. more than anything. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. That's where I'm from. You know, mom and dad were here. Mom needed help with dad. Yeah, it was easy to come back and kind of slip into the uh, working as a stagehand, working for music theater Wichita, mm -hmm. and I did six or seven seasons there, summer yeah. seasons there. Yeah, and how I got back to Wichita State was there was no. You don't have health insurance. You don't have retirement. You don't have all those little benefits that have been, become necessary yeah. in order to get by. Being on the road is nice and romantic. I've been there, yeah, done that yeah, myself. Well, it's romantic. But at a certain point, you 
uh, want to sleep in the same bed at night. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's romantic for, for people who have never done it. Yeah. <laughs> it can be pretty tedious at times. Yeah. You know, now, it, if people did not know who you were and what you were, are, uh, they would get some clues just by looking at this picture because over your right shoulder, there is a rolled up set of architectural plans. Mm -hmm. But over your left shoulder, and, you can, and I don't know if you can aim yeah, your... I, yeah, I can see it, yeah. There is, uh, there is the... Uh, Blueprint it's plans the, the, for the century two. The drawing were one of the, what was called the dog and pony show for century two when it was built. And this is the side section of the concert hall. Yeah. 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 And as far as I know, this is the last one of the eight or so that they did. Yeah. My, um, my former one of the people I worked for, Gene Spangler, who oh, had a position similar to mine here at Wichita State from 19, oh, the late 40s through the time he retired, which was 85, 86. Yeah. And he was on that committee who, he, he was a consultant. He was a community consultant for Century 2. And so he ended up with a couple of these, mm -hmm. which is how I, it came down to me. So I have alluded to your position here at Wichita State, but why don't you elaborate? Uh, and, but, but start that elaboration by uh, uh, explaining how you came, to, came back to Wichita State. Okay. I'm gonna go back a little bit farther. Okay. When I was at Wichita State as a student, I worked for a department with called theater services. Theater services was not unlike performance facilities mm -hmm. in my departments. Now we were responsible for lighting for opera sound and Wilner sound and Miller concert hall the basketball, we did sound for the basketball games. We did commencement. We did things in the CAC theater. Um, we showed movies, you know, in, in the CAC. At that time, it was 16 millimeter, two, two projector switch over. When Mr. Spangler retired, they moved theater services into media resources center. And the MRC wasn't quite sure how to handle this kind of, um, well, we were a bunch of cowboys, really. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we operated totally on the, on the premise that it was far easier to get from forgiveness than permission. Yeah. We would do things. I mean, we, that, that's why there's a recording studio in, in Dirksen now is because about 1980, we built the dang thing and started doing it, just started recording. So I leave, I go do my thing, got on the road, working downtown at Music Theater, Wichita. I was the business agent one year. And the former business agent quit in the middle of Miss USA, the Miss USA pageant. Oh, yeah. And they kind of said, oh, Ray, you're going to do it. You're, you're, you're the assistant business agent. I went, okay. <laughs> I made it for that year. Um, I believe it is still one of the busiest years that, that the local, the, the IA stagehands have yep. ever had. Even with Interest Bank Arena opening and the other contracts they have, it's still dollar for dollar. You know, we did over half a million dollars that year, oh. which was unheard of. Yeah. Um, by the end of that year, I was pretty burned out. And so I did not r run for reelection. <laughs> As the saying goes. Yeah, as the saying goes, yeah. 
And over the summer, a position came up here at Wichita State, which was a part-time position, but with, with benefits to work for performance facilities, which was kind of the successor to theater services that Rhoda Gale Pollock had put together, Dean Pollock had put together yeah. a few years before. I thought, well, you know, it has benefits, it has retirement, medical, I'll apply for it. Mm -hmm. So I applied and got the job. And after about three months, the manager at the time, Michael Burgraff came in and announced, I'm leaving. I'm out of here November 30th. And Dean Walter Myers talked to everyone above me. I mean, keeping in mind, I, I had started three months before. Yeah. He talked to people that had been here for 30 years and people that had been the box office manager and none of them were willing to step up and be in charge. So Walt basically said, Ray, you're going to be in charge. You don't uh, get to say in it. You're just in, you know. And that was over 20 years ago, right? That was, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I, I had planned on being here at Wichita State for four or five years. Okay. And 26 years later, I'm still here. I don't get paid, just, just so you know, I don't get paid that much more. <laughs> that in mind. Well, you should, here. you should talk to the dean about that. Okay. I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> so, okay. So, you know, and so, you know, ironically, at the same time that they were talking about that summer, about adding a three quarter time position, they moved some of the remnants of theater services back to the College of Fine Arts, the recording side of it. Yeah. Um, doing events like commencement, basketball, mm -hmm. uh, the baseball conference, it, press conferences, things at the CAC theater. So what had been a fairly relatively easy job doubled. You went from, well, at the time there were three or 400 events that the college did. And suddenly we're doing three or 400 more. And so it, it kind of, it kind of forges, you know, you know, that, that, that forged in fire thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, you got, you uh, learn. yeah. As you go, I mean, there were a lot of people I know, that I had similar positions in the MRC that would come in for a year or two, or you know, across campus, and they'd leave after a year or two. Mm -hmm. I, I know one guy who just walked out one day, said, yeah. "I I can't do this." Got up, walked out. So, so um, the job is. It's changed somewhat over the years. Yeah. We don't do the big events, the big, well, there used to be the kind of sewer series, which was four or five events throughout the year of a mm -hmm. professional company or a professional artist coming in. Then we promoted and produced, say, a dance company at Century Two, yeah. sometimes two, or a very early on, there were a couple of opera companies that they brought in. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have a jazz. You, sometimes, every so often, there would be a theater company that would be brought in. Yeah. I think, well, yeah. So you got to meet and work with some really interesting people. Mm -hmm. you know? um, Roscoe Lee Brown and Anthony Zerba were great. Wow. That was on Super Bowl Sunday, so the crowd wasn't very big, but they were <laughs> incredible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Roger Reese was one of the nicest people I've ever met. Yeah. 
bought he, he actually bought my dog a a a toy as a thank you to me so yeah. um it's you know obviously this year it's different yeah you know, with COVID. we're not doing as much and what you are doing is oh uh, twice or thrice the challenge uh, because of the way you have to set up because of social distancing things right. like that right yeah so let me i'm gonna go back i'm gonna i, I was gonna say i'm gonna push you in the corner but you're already in the corner i can see in your office there so mm -hmm. You said you were only going to be at Wichita State for four or five years, and then and then move on. What what was it that you were going to move on to? What were you thinking no you might idea. do? You had no I, idea. I had no idea. Oh, okay. I I did not intend to get to to stay here. That's you know, maybe I would have gone back to to Century Two and worked as a stagehand again, mm -hmm. or looked into something outside of Wichita. Yeah. I I really don't know. But but the intent was not to be here for life. And that's probably where I'll be, you know, how it's going to end up now. So I'm going to reveal to our audience the sordid underbelly of Ray Clitheroe. Mm -hmm. While Ray is somewhat self-deprecating about the fact that he never graduated, uh, um, although I think you were only about a dozen credits away, um, uh, Ray is one of the most intelligent people that I've ever met. He is a true Renaissance man. Uh, if I want to know some fact, especially a historical fact, I, I'll pop my head in and ask Ray because he'll know it. If I want to know about some technological thing, I'll pop my head in and ask Ray and he'll know it. Um, and that, that knowledge, that information, that, that spreads all the way from the, the French Renaissance to what the latest software is for some sort of a camera or whatever. Ray truly, truly is a very, very well-read uh, person. Not a, and not just well-read. I, when I say Renaissance, I truly mean it. You, uh, you're a very uh, excellent cook. Uh, you are as good a handyman and do-it-yourself uh, person as I've ever uh, seen. I, I know you have uh, probably done enough uh, projects around your house to say you've built the house from scratch. Probably. So yeah. what is it What is it about a you, what is it about Ray Clitheroe that drives him to do, to read all these books, to do all of these things? I'm going to, I think it's just my parents expected us to learn. Mm-hmm. We were not allowed to, I always got jealous of kids who, you know, growing elementary school, whose parents would take them on trips during the school year. That yeah. was not us. We were expected to be there learning. Yeah. Um, 1970 or 71 there was a really big snowstorm mm -hmm. here in Wichita 12 to 14 inches with 50 mile an hour winds the whole city was basically shut down for three days um, except for my dad who worked for the post office and had to go to work yeah I, mean, we I remember all... that snowstorm, by the way, because I was an undergrad student at West Texas State, and when that same snowstorm hit the Amarillo area, and mm -hmm. uh, we were we were out of class for the entire week. Yeah. So go yeah, ahead. Of course, it was three inches of snow, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> Amarillo. You know. Yeah. But there were three snow days to make up. Yeah. 
One of them had to be on a Saturday. I think I was one of three students <laughs> in the entire elementary building that Saturday because my mom said, yes, you are going to school. And, and you constituted a quorum. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. I think one of the other ones was my brother. So my, you know, there was one other kid whose mom and parents said, yeah, you are going to school. Yeah. And that, that's a slight exaggeration, but there were maybe a dozen kids. They, they all brought us into one classroom. Yeah. So, um, but no, I, I think it's just that I'll, I'll just use the word quest for knowledge. Yeah, thirst. Yeah, that thirst for knowledge, you know, I mean, I, it doesn't really do me any good, but. Well, it rounds you out as a person. I kick you, I, I, I kick ass at Jeopardy. <laughs> you know, I and, mean, I, I've, I've never been on it. I, if I went on it, I'd probably stammer and not answer any questions, but. But you sit there in your uh, living room uh, exactly. yelling out all the yeah. answers, huh? Right. And, you know, you, my brothers and I get together or, you know, all of my siblings get together mm -hmm. and we do the same thing. We're all answering Jeopardy questions. Yeah. Yeah. That, that game. Um, Trivia Pursuit. Trivial Pursuit. It's, you know, and, and it's really kind of amazing what you can dredge up out of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. So well, let me ask you this on, on that background. Um, what, I mean, you, as I said, you are a voracious reader. Um, what interests you the most? I mean, what kind of reading do you really enjoy the most? Um, mainly well, broad terms, nonfiction. Yeah. Um, have always been fascinated with natural history, science, history. Um, special in areas in history. The uh, Crusades. Don't ask me why. Maybe because it was doomed to failure, or you know, it it you know the the, the whole Christian era in the Middle East lasted you know where they when they were in charge was less than two hundred years. Yeah, yeah, it's just fascinated me. Um, my dad was in World War II in the Pacific. He he was actually a a pre war Marine. Mm. Um, went. En enlisted right out of high school in 1939, I believe. Yeah. And went through the duration. So the South Pacific has always, in World War II in the South Pacific has always been a big uh, area of interest for me. Mm -hmm. um, the settling of, or the, the American West. Mm hmm I, I've, and you know, odd little tidbits from Kansas. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, you know, local history that a lot of people don't know. I was about to interject and say, you, you're, you are, your knowledge of local Wichita history is just about unmatched, too. Thanks. <laughs> you know, um, Right now, I'm reading an odd little book I found called The Apparitionists. And it's about a certain, a, a specific photographer in Boston mm -hmm. in 1862 through mm, 1870. And it, it, the, the idea that 
is being developed here or was, that's kind of a bad pun actually. <laughs> but they would, when they took photos of people, yeah. it would be a shape in the background, a, a sort of shadowy figure. I'm only about halfway through. Oh, okay. So we don't know. We're, we're, I'm fairly certain they had some process of for developing the, the film, developing and, and having the shape in the background, but no one has yet found it. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, I, I mean, in the book. Yeah. We're only about halfway, you know, they're, it, it's, it's coming up and, and they're finding, you know, he, they, they, professional photog other photographers have been watching and, and, and can't figure out how he's doing it. Ah, uh, okay. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a series of questions about books. Okay. okay. Um, which book was, is your favorite book to have read and why? Mark Helprin's A Winter's Tale. A Winter's Tale. All right. Yeah. Uh, it was made into a movie a few years back with Will Smith and Russell Crowe. Mm -hmm. And I forget who the ingenue is. But fiction. Yeah. But it was very lyrical. I read it, it, it was published, oh gosh. I was 40 years ago. Yeah. At least. And it just taught me that it, it, it was the writing was just so beautiful. Yeah. You know, it, it really struck me. You know, every so often I go back and I reread it. I was, I was going to ask my next question was what's your guiltiest pleasure, the book that you keep rereading and that, and so you've probably answered There's that, that question one there. and then Watership Down and yeah. Lord of the Rings. Ah, yeah. Read that when I was like in fourth or fifth grade. Yeah. So, what is it about Lord of the Rings that it's just the story, you? just the story itself. Yeah. The story itself. It's yeah. not really the fact that, that Tolkien came up with this whole mythology. You know, I mean, if you start reading the appendices, you know. Oh. You can, yeah. yeah. No. So you love Lord of, uh, Lord of the Rings, but you're not a huge fan of the Cimmerillion then. Oh, no. no. <laughs> I've tried the Sil to read the Cimmerillion three or four times. Yeah, it's it's, it's just a little... Yeah, it's a little too dense. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or I'm too dense to appreciate yeah. it. I don't know sure. which. But let's go back to Winter's Tale. What, what's it about? Um, oh, gosh. It is set in New York in the 18... It's actually about New York City, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. In the 1890s. And it is... You have a a child who was raised in New Jersey by a group of primitive tribesmen who go yeah. across to, he eventually goes to New York City, meets a woman, falls in love. The woman dies of tuberculosis. Mm. Um, there's a, a more than a few underlying stories in there. You know, you he introduced, um, oh, it's one of the gangs of New York. The short tales, I believe, is what he calls them. Hmm. The rabbit tales. T-A-T-A-I-L-S. Yeah. Um, they're chasing him. I mean, it's... It's, it's a fantasy. Yeah. Which is, huh. you know. But it's a fantasy that takes place in the past. Right. Ah. In the past, in New York. 
Okay. In the 1890s and okay. jumps back and forth in time. Actually, you don't really realize that. I didn't realize that the first time I read it, but he's jumping back and forth in time. Mm. Okay. So, okay. So, um, you love to spend hours and hours reading, and yet you're you're not a couch potato. Um, if I have a question on plumbing, I go ask Ray. Yeah. If yeah. I have a question on uh, flooring and tile work, I go ask Ray. If I have a question about electric that's, electrical, and I go ask Ray. I mean, you. That's one of the things that came from Dad. Ah. Uh, talk Dad. about that. My dad was, well, he would be, he would have been 102 a couple of days ago. Yeah. Grew up on a farm outside of Peabody, Kansas. Mm -hmm. The, there's, most of the farm is gone now. They tore down the house a few years ago. They tore down the barn. Mm -hmm. He grew up in a time when they did not have elect. They got electricity in the thirties sometime early thirties. Yeah. And he was a cabinet maker. He was a, a carpenter, house carpenter, framing houses, did plumbing, did heating and air. And he was very capable of, Concrete work. We did a lot of concrete work, too, growing up. He was took completely capable of building his own house, which he did. And he had actually planned to, they had purchased five acres in West Wichita, mom and dad. Yeah. yeah. And they were planning on building a couple of other houses and selling them. But something went awry with the platting and Somebody else got there first and they got the street when dad did not. So he wasn't able to sell it. Uh, yeah. So we ended up with a huge garden. <laughs> we had acres of gardens. Yeah. We planted three to 400 tomato plants every year and a quarter yeah. acre of corn. And, you know, so you were uh, semi professional truck farmers. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we had a little roadside stand and we would have to sit and wait for people to come by. And we sold tomatoes and onions and potatoes and squash and watermelons and more mm -hmm. tomatoes. And um, that kind of led to a lot of reading because at the time... <laughs> We were out on the outskirts of Wichita, so not many people came by. Yeah. And it's now um, all suburban. Oh, so, yeah. You yeah. sprawl. Yeah, it's sprawl. Okay. So you you developed an affinity for food by sitting at a yeah. stand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know from and, our conversations, yeah. you're a you're a great cook. You know, I, um, I learned about renovating houses or doing stuff around the house because I had to help dad. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Working on the truck. You have to hold the flashlight, right? You know, that's. Yeah. yeah. That, and that, that was back in the days when you could actually still work on your own car. True. <clears throat> Nowadays, if you even touch the undercarriage, you, uh, Void yeah. the warranty because you've probably disconnected some computer chip. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. You know, the whole electronic thing is kind of screwed things up as far as working on your own. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and that, you know, and cooking came about by necessity. I mean, I like eating. I'm kind of addicted to eating. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what is your favorite uh, recipe to oh. cook? And what is your favorite recipe to eat? I'm not even going to answer that. I really, you know, probably, uh, well, favorite style. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say 
Italian. Italian? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, go ahead. Um, you know, I will say this about, th there's only about one type of food or one vegetable that I don't really care for. And that is eggplant. Ah, you and I should start the society like for the demise of eggplant. Yeah, I'm, I'm I, not a great I, fan I, of it either. I like pickled eggplant. Yeah. Um, I think my loathing of eggplant came about because my mom mm -hmm. would bread and fry it. Yeah. And as a six-year-old, you're sitting there going, oh boy, chicken fried steak. <laughs> and you get the vegetarian version. And you get, the, yeah, you get the vegetarian version. And it's not, mm -mm. So. so. So, as I say, you're such a Renaissance man. Uh, if there's something that you could learn that you don't know now, uh, what would it be? The biggest regret <clears throat> that I have is that I only took a couple of flying lessons. Mm, okay. Um, I wish I had continued that farther. I wish if, if I if I was to completely redirect my life, yeah, I would go back to when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, right? And really would have really considered a career in aviation. Hmm. Um, How so? What is it about aviation that fascinates you? Growing up, in the flight path for one of the runways ah. for the Wichita airport. Mm -hmm. At that time, you saw a lot more different aircraft than you see now. Yeah. I can barely remember constellations for TWA airliners, constell Lockheed constellations. Oh flying. yeah, yeah. And I've seen one, the one time that they flew the brand F747 into Wichita was, I happened to be outside mm. and saw it flying in. Yeah. So, you know, there was a lot more general, general aviation at that time. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by general aviation? Small, small aircraft, civil air. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, let's go back. You, you mentioned the big ditch. Mm-hmm. Most people listening don't even understand or appreciate what the big ditch is. Explain and elaborate on that. Oh, okay. I, I think a lot of people, well, if you grew up in Wichita, you know what the big ditch is. Yeah. The big ditch is the official name is the Wichita Valley Center Floodway Control Project. Mm-hmm. And it was a started back in the fifties. There was a well, there was a really couple of series of devastating floods in downtown Wichita. 1944 yeah. is one. Uh, 1947, there was one. I think in one in in fifty one. Mm -hmm. You know, water four feet deep, fl flowing down Douglas. Wow. You know, people on, on canoes in, in rowboats rescuing saving. other people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the valley, the flood control is basically they connected a series of marshes and sloughs and canal and cut a canal that goes from about 61st Street around down to the south end of down by um, Derby. Yeah. Just north of Derby. And it's to direct excess water around Wichita. 
really controversial at the time because it was going through farm ground. Oh my God, we can't have that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that there were, you know, they used to take pot shots at guys working on the, on the flood control, but it's, you know, they're at just west of um, Hoover, Hoover Street in West Wichita, or just to the east of it. And, you know, it, I, I don't remember Wichita before yeah. that. My, my, some of my siblings do. They remember the. Well, I know this. <clears throat> I've lived here um, almost 18 years. And we've had some pretty raunchy rains. And mm -hmm. I've never, uh, with a little bit of exception in maybe Southwest Wichita, uh, but it, but nothing, nothing that even would approach that. No. But, but, but the term, the big ditch is too prosaic for what it actually is. Cause it actually won some design awards, did it not? Mm, it, if at one time, I believe it was the largest civic civil project in Kansas. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's the equivalent of, of building a highway around, if not yeah. more. Yeah. There's some other things that, um, it was supposed to do, <clears throat> excuse me, they, they had pumping stations and they would pump water out of the ditch into low-lying areas just on, on the other side of the levees, which they eventually determined they didn't need to do that. And that's where they built 235. Mm -hmm. I-235 I is built over that, one of the, the impoundment areas. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, there's actually, if you go to the, what's it called? The Big River Park at 21st Street and West. Mm -hmm. There's a whole series of placards, you know, outdoor signs that talk about the creation of the Big Ditch. Uh, it, it's the only place that, that I know of that it's really recognized. Recognized or memorialized, yeah. There's no yeah. real plaques or anything else that I found. So in your extended uh, time and experience with Wichita and Wichita State, what are the biggest changes that you've seen to Wichita? We have sprawled. There are, you know, when I was growing up on the west side, yeah. Wichita basically stopped at about Tyler, yeah. Tyler Street. Now it goes on for, you know, miles, three or, three or four miles out there. There was nothing north of 13th Street. It and actually that, butts up against Goddard now. Yeah, right. There used to be a lot of empty farm ground. Yeah, you know. yeah no houses or anything between Wichita and, and Goddard. And now it, you can't really tell. Yeah. What about the commercial aspects of Wichita, uh, you know, businesses and so forth. I mean, obviously aviation is the 2000 pound gorilla uh, in this. Right. Community. But even then I think that, and just as an outsider, I'm not a, you know, but I see fewer, I, I know a fewer friends of mine, fewer people I know that are working yeah. in aviation. Yeah. That used to be, oh, you can always get a job at, at Boeing. Mm. You can always get a job at Cessna. You can always get a job at Beach. Yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore. No. You know, and the little commercial shop, you know, the machine shops that used to be operating Mm -hmm. you know, that actually had probably had more people working for them than Boeing did. So how has, I'm sorry, what? Th those little machine shops are, are dying. They're going away. Yeah. 
so how has the building of or our, or the building up i'll say of kellogg changed wichita oh it's a lot easier to go east to west yeah um it's odd that now there's there's a very definite dividing line between north and south wichita mm -hmm. you know i i can remember uh you know, a few years back, watching a, a weather report on one of the local TV stations, and they kept yeah. talking about how the thunderstorm won't go south of Kellogg. It yeah. just won't go south of Kellogg. <laughs> like that was important. Like it was important, and like there was this giant wall coming up from Kellogg that kept it from going south yeah. of yeah. Kellogg. Yeah. Um, you know, it's given a lot of honestly it's given a lot of work to people yeah do it and working on it various construction companies etc yeah it's there's a big difference between 1960s wichita and 2020 wichita mm -hmm. there aren't as many 1960s Wichita has had all the garish billboards and everything else that you expected to see back then. Yeah. That I expected, you know. Yeah. You go back and look at old postcards and it's like, wow. And Broadway was the main north south right at that time. Yeah. And uh, I know I know that part of the big ditch process is it not uh, is where um, 135 cuts wichita mm, no i don't think that's part of it oh it, okay has a the, the canal yeah which was actually a creek okay that was channelized okay um as a matter of fact third street used to have a creek that ran down the middle of it mm -hmm. literally ran and well then they took Third Street out and left the creek. Yeah. So let me ask you, a, um, might even be a more obvious question. Um, uh, what are the biggest changes you've seen at Wichita State? And, and I say that because, uh, and I know from the 17 years that I've been here, that it's a much, much different university than the one that I came to in 2004. Oh, yeah. well, what about you? Um, to start out, the biggest change, the, I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to say the most disruptive Yeah, was redoing all the parking lots in a year and a half. Ah, okay. You know, the layout of the parking lots and the streets and everything just got changed. You know, there were a few that stayed. Yeah. But they changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And... You know, to to throw this out too that I don't think we've ever really had a parking problem. No. At Wichita State, I'll be the one of the things I I like walking. Yeah. I've never been one to really worry about having a parking space within steps of the building that I'm going to. Yeah. I can, In. In the words of uh, one of our previous presidents, uh, John Bardo, we don't have a parking problem at Wichita State. We have a parking proximity problem. Right. right. <laughs> Not everybody is happy with the fact that they can't park um, 42 steps from their mm -hmm. office. <laughs> right. right. You know, and, and that is one thing that's been kind of nice the last year. Yeah. You know, the... 2020, the year of COVID. Yeah. No one's complained about the parking. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of gone away. So let me, so let you, me change direction here a little bit. Yeah. On your best day, what are you doing? On my best, ooh, you know, that's kind of a loaded question. Oh, obviously. <laughs> yeah. You know, because if, if I'm on my best... I really, my, 
my best day, I think, would be just being home. Yeah. You know, doing, what are you doing at home? Well, see, whatever I want to. <laughs> you know, if that's digging around in the dirt, if that's doing a home project, if it's just sitting and reading and not having to worry about answering the phone or anything. Yeah. Yeah. You hmm. know, it's. Okay. Not, you know, not, not going to sound kind of petulant, I think. But I, I, I would really kind of like to be retired. <laughs> I'm, I'm really looking forward to re being retired. Well, except I know you well enough to know that, that you will not the, be uh, laconic. Yeah, right. You, re re retirement is not going to be sitting in a beach chair. Yeah. Just drinking cocktails. Yeah. 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 What is the best thing that anyone has ever done for you? And maybe wrapped up in that would be, what is the best advice anyone ever gave you? Mm. The best, well, the best advice I've ever gotten yeah. came from His name was Richard Smith. He had been the business agent for the local, for the stagehands yeah. back in the 70s. And mm -hmm. he and I, he did not get along with everyone, but he and I got along. Yeah. And the year that I was business agent, there was some, somebody was complaining or something and a, a client. And Richard said, you know, took me aside and said, you know, sometimes the best way to handle this is just to go for it and deal with it. Don't let it fester. Yeah. And so I did. I went and talked to the client and they realized that what they were complaining about didn't have anything to do with us, actually. Yeah. Had to do with more with the building. Yeah. But, you know, I remember that. He, well, I, I probably shouldn't go into to Richard. Um, the nicest thing, I'm not really sure. You know, mm -hmm. um, I would say one of the things that, that has always, I've always felt good about yeah. was Walt Myers telling me, you'd better apply for this job. <laughs> now, you know, I mean, sometimes I rue the day that I applied for this job, about it, but yeah. by and large, it, it's been okay. I mean, personalities come and go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like any, anything, any place. Mm -hmm. What people don't realize about the job that you do is how, how much you interact with the students and not just necessarily uh, fine art students, but students from all across campus. Yeah. Talk about that a little well, bit. Well, I, I used to, mm -hmm. that, that, that just needs to be, you know, I mean, we, I used to interact with them a whole lot more. I don't as much, mm -hmm. but even then, you know, but that being said, yeah, because we hire students, we don't just hire students from fine arts to work. Yeah, yeah. We hire students, if they show an interest, and have some skill, we're probably going to hire them. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why when fine arts gets busy, you know, we're busy. Yeah. If all we have are fine arts students, then they're all, they're, a lot of them are busy performing. 
or yeah. you know and it especially the second half of the spring semester when everything is coming to closure yeah. that last choral concert that uh, yeah, senior recital the, yeah yeah yes. oh i can't work today because uh i have to well or the time that um we had planned for a he was a music major bassoon yeah and he was going to work the opera and he came in on Sunday of Opera Tech and said, I was told I had to play in the pit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Mm. And we were told, well, he's here to play bassoon, not, mm -hmm. not to work. Oh, okay. So here's another loaded question. All right. If you could have an unlimited amount of something, what would it be? Hmm. I think time. Ah, bingo. I knew that's what you were going to say. <laughs> Why an unlimited amount of time? Do you, I mean. Because there's really too many know. books to read. Yeah. You know, too many yeah. It, it projects to do. You know, when, when I found out that, you know, you know how many new books are published every year? Yeah. Somewhere on, you know, in the order of 300,000. Yeah. You read one new book a year. It's what, 0.01%, 0.001%, some, something like that. Yeah. So many books, so little time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Actually, yeah, one book, one new book a day. Wow. Yeah. 365, that would probably be what, 1% of yeah. everything that gets published? Not Close even. To well, maybe one percent of what gets published a day. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah it's like three hundred thousand. You know. Now you know some of it we don't care about. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Politicians' uh, biographies, I don't think. Care about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said you don't. Uh, you prefer nonfiction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. So here's my last question. What would you like your obituary to say about you? Well, I hope it says good things. Mm -hmm. um, I've always kind of viewed obituaries and funerals as for the living. Yeah. I think it says you, you'd have a lot of hubris and ego to write your own obituary. Yeah. I, you know, I, I hope, like I say, I, I hope people say nice things about me. If they have a funeral for me, I hope people show up, but I'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. Ray, this has really been, um, excellent. I mean, um, I've enjoyed, uh, this exchange yeah. very much. Um, any, any last parting comments that you'd like to tell the listeners? No. Okay. I, I really, you know, I mean, I, we need to be more kind to each other. People aren't as kind as they used to be. I don't think. Yeah. Kindness. Okay. That's a great way to, to end this. Yeah. People should be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. Ray, thank you so much. Sure. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, it was very kind of you to uh, <laughs> agree to this. So Ray Clitheroe, the Director of Fine Arts Facilities. Thank you so much. You're welcome.